Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests. Thank you for joining us for this ticketed event of the eighth annual Oakville Film Festival and OFA 2021. My name is Tyler Collins. I'm your host and moderator this evening. I also work as the arts reporter for Oakville News. You can read us for free every day online at oakvillenews.org. We are so grateful that you are joining us here for this evening's closing night event. It is the last day of our festival and we're so happy to have you here. For tonight, we are joined by so many of our panelists for the Animated Shorts Showcase. We are joined by several of the artists, directors, writers, animators, co producers, composers, and they are here to talk about all of the excellent short films that you just had the pleasure of seeing. Tonight's event is being sponsored by Kaju Multimedia, and we're grateful for their support, not just for the Oakville Film Festival, but for tonight's presentation. Joined tonight, I am here with always with our executive director, Wendy Donnan, and also our technical producer, Tori Nixon, who's been working hard all week in the background with all of the technical work uh, to make these live Q and A's possible. Now we're joined here by representatives from five different short films of the collection you just got to watch. First, from Big Little Show, we have writer, director, and producer, Gemma Eva. Hi, everybody. Joining us from Los Angeles, the writer, director, and animator of a poem by Alba, Yu Lee. Hi, it's an honor. <laughs> we're also here with the director and animator of High Roller, Ekaterina Gretzkaya. Hello. We have two of our friends from A New Melody. We're here with both director and animator, Megan Babchuk, zooming in from Unity, Saskatchewan. Hello, everyone. And she's also here with composer Emmanuel Donofrio, coming from Copenhagen tonight. Hello, everyone. Finally, we have two of the artists from Footsteps in the Wind, both of them from Sao Paulo, Brazil tonight. We have executive producer Ito Anderi. Hi, everyone. And one of the three co-directors, Faga Mello. Hi there, everybody. All of you, thank you so much for sharing your films with us and also making the time to be here tonight. Best of all, this is a live Q&A. This is a live feature that is happening right now, and that means you, the audience, can also participate. Over here on the right-hand side of your screen, there is a text entry box where you can type in questions on the behalf of, well, yourselves. Send them in to us, and they'll be sent to me, where I can ask them directly on your behalf to our fabulous panel this evening. Now, to get us started, uh, because we have five, we have the seven of you here from five very different short films, I'd like to talk kind of about your process of animation at large. Because one of the great joys of making an animated short film uh, and celebrating the style of animation is you can craft any kind of world, however realistic or fantastic as you want to. So uh, this is, if you have an answer, just go ahead, throw up your hand and we'll go around. Talk to me what it's like designing these worlds uh, in all of their environments, real, fantastic. How do you start coming up with these environments for your movies to be set in? I'll go first, Tyler. Yeah, go ahead, you. Oh, sorry, sorry, Faga. So oh. it's, it's the, the thing I love about uh, stop motion and animation in particular is you nailed that it. it's the world building and through fabrication and visioning and color design and also texture that we that I'm able to have a complete control over what world that I get to build. And what I love about stop motion in particular is that my puppet, they can live forever. They don't die. Like there's, there you know, um, there's, I'm, I'm, keenly aware of preciousness of time, especially during a pandemic, what we went through, how precious life is. And I think having that complete control is what I love about animation, about complete control over time and aesthetics. Faga, you were next. No, I agree with you, Lee, but our film was a 2D animation, but I think, I think in the same way, you know, like every film, it's kind of dive into the ocean, you know, with a lot of, different styles you can imagine in everything of your environment and your character and personalities, behaviors. So it's like a playful world that you can uh, create everything. So it's, you, you can like 
create different visions, different reflections, so you can play with everything in animation. That's why I think it's one of the most beautiful things in this kind of movies, you know? Maybe one of the things I'd love to hear about from the 2D animation directors, uh, there seems to be a lot of trends for claymation and computer animation, 3D, and yet the art of 2D drawings and 2D film is very much well and alive. What does it mean to you personally as artists to keep working in the 2D animation medium? Yeah, Megan? Or Gemma, I'm sorry, Je Gemma. No worries. Though I didn't animate uh, the film myself, I wanted to do a, to produce a 2D film because that's the animation style that I grew up with and with, that's very nostalgic to me. Um, not to mention that I wanted to encapsulate a golden age style film. So the 2D felt very fitting uh, for, for the style and it's just something that I adore watching. That's it. Sorry. Yeah, Katarina? Um, for my film, uh, I chose, I ended up doing 2D for my film uh, because I found that a lot of the things that inspired me and in the, like, the creation of it were 2D. And I thought that the style would translate best in 2D rather than 3D, which was a style I had contemplated doing at the very start of developing my film. All right, we are getting in some questions from the audience, but before we get to those, we just had a late joiner uh, coming into us. We're also very fortunate to be joined now by Trey Sai, who is the director of An Eternal Igloo. Hi, Trey, it's nice to have you join us this evening. Hi, I just wanna clarify, I'm attending on behalf of the director, Mustafa Kishvari, because unfortunately he's uh, occupied in a project and was not able to attend. So I am part of the production team because I am also the vice president of BC Minorities uh, in Film and TV Society, uh, the nonprofit organization uh, in association with the production of um, Eternal Igloo. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for welcoming me and uh, yeah, I apologize for the slight delay, yeah. No trouble. Thank you so much for joining us, Trey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we have our first question coming in from the audience, and this goes directly to all of the animators specifically. Uh, this is from Dan. I'm always interested to hear how people learn to animate. So how did each of you start out? Yeah, Faga. So I one of the directors of the Footsteps on the Wind, but I started my career as an animator as well. So I think, uh, but I, but I, I have worked with live action. I think it's the same way, you know. You like, you need to study a lot, but also practice a lot. That you don't have like another math to do this, you know. It's it's part of the job, you know. You need to be like always struggling, like like always trying to reach our goals, your goals. But that's the point, you know. Like doesn't have like uh, the best path. To, to, to start your journey. I think you need to have like curiosity. You need to have like this, always this feeling to learn, learn, learn more, more and more. And that's it, you know, that's, that was my journey, part of my journey, like always practicing, always studying. And that's it. I don't know if everybody agree with me here, but for me, that's the point, you know, the, 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 the main point of to be an animator. I think being in animation too, there's a lot of technical skill required to do the art, whether it's sculpting, drawing, or the computer software needed to create figures uh, digitally. So I, I think building on Dan, I'm curious to hear from any or all of the animators, where did you learn and how these technical skills? I like to chime in for because I think I have a little bit of an unusual story and I, I want to give people hope who doesn't come from animation background. So my background is in fashion. So I was a fashion designer for 20 plus years. And then when I had my daughter, I had a profound awakening of wanting to kind of capture the moment. And I didn't know how to do 3D animation and I could draw, but not that well. So I really got into stop motion and it became like something I was obsessed with for a year. And I made three stop motion 
motion music video like lullabies and things for my daughter and I was at a cross path and I it could either become a very expensive hobby or I can really learn the fundamental and become make something out of it so I actually enrolled at USC MFA program and got in and um, it's been about two years of really immersing myself in animation and I want to give anybody who's interested in telling us becoming a storyteller that it is never too late, I think, to follow your passion. And if you give it all, I think there is always um, something that's going to be worthwhile. So that's my little background. And I wanted to tell that to people. I, I, I love to, to hear this, Julie, because like I said before, uh, you don't have like a clear math to do these things, you know, in terms in general terms in, in the animation environment, like, like Tyler said about the software, for me, it's just a tool, you know, like you can, you have like this background with fashion uh, industry. Uh, so you could be like with a lot of backgrounds and absorb a lot of things to turn into an art, in animation art, you know, because the software is going to be just a tool to explore what you're going to, what you're going to say, you know. So that's the point. Of course, you can learn like 3D softwares, 2D softwares, but you're going to figure out how you can explore your narrative, like you said now with the puppets in, in stop motion as well. So that's, that's the, the magic, magical environment that I loved in, into the animation world, you know. Um, yeah, this is Trey here, and I just want to comment that, you know, thank you for sharing, and thank you, Raga, for sharing, because um, I also want to emphasize that you don't have to specifically come from a particular background to be able to do animation, but this is not to disrespect, you know, people that are industry experts in the field, but I'm just saying, um, you know, to answer, touch on what Tyler was saying um, in the beginning was, I think you start by watching all the animation that you love as a kid growing up, right? Because that's where it all comes from. It plants the seeds of imagination in, in, your, in your minds, right? And as you're growing up, um, your journey enriches you and all the things that you see, all the stories that you see, uh, even social and current events, you know, the news, the globe, right? Everything has an impact, you know, to how you see things. And then you put it into motion. So, you know, in one aspect, the, the very, um, you know, complex software that we have to use for animation, those certainly you need that, right? To complete a proper animation. But at the same time, it, it may come just from a simple storyboard that, you know, appears on a piece of paper and a pen. And when that gets in motion, we have our iPads and, you know, Apple, you know, pencils and stuff, and you're kind of just animating away. And then you, you meet people with um, similar minds, you know, and you come to work together and put that together. And that's how we can create really beautiful projects, you know, whether it's animation or films and stories. So there's no one concrete pathway to this because it's, and it's like really to do with how you see things and how you go about, you know. And um, I think the beauty of animation is that you get to put everything that is impossible possibly in life and put it into the possible category. So I, I find that truly amazing. So, yeah. You know, while we're talking about animation, uh, I believe it was Walt Disney who said, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. And that was a mantra that built a lot of his business uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, that's also a good segue talking about the source of ideas. We have another uh, question from the audience. This from an unnamed member. I'm curious how many of you come up with such creative ideas. What are your inspirations for these films? And so I think this could go one of two ways if you'd like to answer. One, where you got the specific idea for your film, but also what is a way in which you get ideas in general? Tyler, yeah. I'm sorry, but I like to talk, dude. If you wanna, I can ask this question as well. So, dude, I don't know if everybody agree with me, but I think when you work in the, in the film industry, like in general, not just animation, uh, your inspiration could be like your routine, you know, your, your daily goals, you know, your, your, your child, your parents, your relatives, your, your, like I said, your routine. So for me, uh, every time that I, that I make something that it's not pretty related with film, 
could be turning into a film, you know? So my inspirations are always everything that I listen, everything that I see, everything that I smell. I think creative steps, it's always about sensations that you can turn into your, your film. So that's why, and for talking about like footsteps on the wind, it's, it's a movie that, that we talk about refugees, you know, like, so it's people that was, a, was in a hard situation in this quarantine and pandemic and all over the world. So everybody that you watch the news, you, you heard and you read something uh, and you just pay attention in behaviors of the society, it's always an inspiration to turn it into the, this narrative. So for me, and also on behalf of my co-directors, Maya and Gustavo, and also with our script writer, we started to search. Our sources was always um, books, journals, and, and press, and news about the current situation, and of course, all the history of this this community, you know? So if you open your eyes for all the situations of your environment, could be something that you can create into a film, you know? That's my opinion. Is there, uh, is there anyone else who wants to touch on this or, or would we like, to... yeah, go ahead, Gemma. Yes, yeah, so I originally come from a music theater background and this project was used um, that I, I created for my MFA um, final project. And so when creating a story, I enjoy writing stories about artists. And so as my finale project, I wanted to um, amalgamate my two favorite things of theater uh, and film together. Um, so I really wanted to focus on a story that most artists feel and that's a, a story about an artist being passionate about their work, feeling rejection and still persevering. Um, so I felt like it was a story that a lot of artists, no matter what field or what type can relate to. And I wanted to just do a nice wholesome story, especially in the midst of a pandemic. I felt like it was really needed. Thank you. Well, you bring up an interesting topic, Gemma. Uh, and in a moment, we'll start talking about music in your movies. Uh, but just before we do, we had another late arrival just come in. Uh, I just want to introduce, we have the writer, director, and I believe one of the co-animators of the abandoned block, James Bourne. Hi, James. Just so you know, uh, we, we see you. We're really glad to have you here uh, for, for the second half of our live animation shorts uh, Q&A this evening. Thank you. Really glad to be here. My apologies for the uh, late arrival. My fault okay. completely. Uh, if at any point you want to ask a question, just throw it up when when we give out a prompt and uh, we'll let you have a turn. So for everybody here, uh, I think music is integral to the art of cinema in and of itself. But in animation, if you look at the, the history of this medium over the last hundred years, music has a really special relationship uh, to this genre. And I think it plays really well into it, whether or not it's songs uh, like in Footsteps in the Wind or Big Little Show, or if it's the orchestral music that goes on beyond it. So I'd like to start with Emmanuel first to talk about what it's like to score uh, animation, but then also if any of you want to talk about how music was important to your movies. Yeah, I think that music is an essential part of the, of the film because of course it boosts the kind of emotion you want to deliver and the message you want. And it always has a special effect on the audience because music can reach people from every background, every culture, no matter what, what is the cultural background. So in my experience, I think it's something that you feel while watching the film. Um, you, for with Meg, she firstly presented, showed me her, her first animation, and it was like a spontaneous natural process for me, watching her raw animation without sounds and feeling the music inside. So I think the collaboration between composer and animator is something very mutual and very um, specifically conceived and very deep, it, it should be. Um, it's, we shall say that now also the role of the composer is changing the way music is 
is being written for films is changing. It's not the age of John Williams or Ennio Morricone for, uh, anymore, but there is still a special place for music in, in films and it can help a lot, the, also the visual part. Meg, can you tell us what, what that relationship was like from your end, working with Emmanuel on the project? Yeah, so I was from the story end because I conceived the original idea. Um, and I knew from the get-go that the music was going to be like the main important story element because my film had no dialogue. And I knew that it focused on one character going through a series of emotions and of discovery, essentially. Um, and I knew that... Um, the music was going to have to change and tell that story and that anticipation and build it up for the audience and bring them along. Um, and I think Emmanuel understood that right away. Like, I think I remember when we first talked, it just felt like he, he knew. And so going through that process over the course of um, about four months, I think it was. Um, yeah, I just felt like every meeting things made sense. We would revise things and I would get things back. And it was just like, it was also yielding um, or giving away control over that because I'm not musical. Um, so I had to trust that his intuition was going to carry the film well, which was a very interesting process um, as an artist because we get specific um, ideas in our heads about how things should go. Um, and it's really hard to communicate those things sometimes, but I think that um, that was a really interesting process for me to yeah, relinquish that control. And I think Emmanuel did a fantastic job of understanding what the film um, needed and letting his score just carry the story worked really, really well. So now we'll open it up to uh, others. Is there anyone else who wants to touch on how music played into their films? I would. Um, yeah. So well, what hey, I did. Your, yours also, James, yours also has no dialogue and it's just completely, uh, it, it's just the music that's going on with the story of the marble. That's right. And so because I was telling a story about a completely inanimate object, I had to rely completely upon, you know, the animation and um, the music. The music was particularly challenging because I'm I'm not a musician. I, I used to play piano, but that's really the best I can say. I was very lucky to have a great composer uh, like Devin Roth, who's actually done a lot of music for um, the Troll Hunters series, um, along with other movies as well. And um, I really wanted to give Devin free reign just because I knew the limitations to what I could give um, in this field. I mean, I storyboarded, animated, designed, and edited this film uh, myself, except for the animation part. I had a few people involved with me, but the music was entirely Devin. And all I did when I sent him my work was, I've got a temp track, just listen to it once, then ignore it, because you're the guy who knows how to do this stuff. And all I really knew was that um, the theme of my story was potential. So all I knew was that I wanted the same thing to play throughout the series, but I wanted the keys to change. And believe it or not, I got that actually from a joke that Bill Burr did. Um, uh, excuse me, Bill Bailey, not Bill Burr, my bad. Um, he did in a com comedic routine. He played the Star Spangled Banner, um, the, the national anthem of the United States in one key. Then he played it in a completely different key. And then it sounded like um some like movie villain theme when he played it in that theme so that's what i wanted to do i took i told Devin write the same song but change the keys in the beginning and then change it in the end because in the beginning it sounds more depressing because the block is rejected then it sounded a lot more uplifting in the end because finally somebody takes the exact same block and he actually sees you know potential in it for what it could become so that was basically my mindset as I was doing the music with Devin and uh, he did a fantastic job on that, I think. I, I agree. I think one of the things that connected not just yours, but all of the films tonight, uh, you know, uh, Meg was talking about that relationship and how when you don't have words and you don't have some of the traditional parts of film, music becomes more important, uh, especially with the wise words of Bill Burr, uh, famous film score, <laughs> indeed. Bill Bailey, excuse me. I, I said oh, the wrong no, word. I'm sorry. I'm joking, James. Uh, <laughs> that's all. Uh, next, I'd kind of like to hit on the topic of producing animation, because it's a totally different beast in the business world of producing animation to producing a live action film. So I know we have Ido and Trey, but some of you were also producers of your own work. So let's start with the two of you first. 
talk to us. What's what are some of the unique challenges of producing animation specifically? Uh, may I go first? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, I work at Dirty Work, a um, uh, production company here in Brazil, a film production company. And we do a lot of animation work, but we also produce films like with camera. And this film in particular was very different for us because we do a lot of advertising. And this, is, uh, this was a short film, a seven minute film. I think uh, the toughest part of it, uh, I mean, the, the real challenge was connect, uh, connect everybody during this pande pandemic times. I mean, we had more than 100 people working in this film and people from Brazil and people from abroad and different um, timetables. I mean, uh, different kind of people and uh, a lot of um, different skilled people to do the same thing and reach the final project like beautifully. And I think that, that was the most challenging thing and as well as the music, because we had a uh, sting music, which was ready. And we started thinking it would be like a video clip for a sting. And it turned out to be a short film, which is running uh, all, of, all of the festivals in the world right now. And it was challenging. I think Faga would uh, say it better and know it better. but to bring this film alive um, on, a, on, a, on a song that was ready already, you know? That was another challenging part. Mm -hmm. And because it was for a famous person as well. I mean, it's Sting. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Sting songs, Sting music since he was from the police. So mm -hmm. this, this was a bit uh, frightening. That's it. Yeah. I'll never forget Sting's first contribution. This is a little known fact. He originally did the music for the 2000 animated film, The Emperor's New Groove. Uh, and most of his work got cut, but they left one song in just at the end for fun. Uh, Trey, uh, do you want to talk to us about uh, the, the challenges of specifically producing animation? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about that. And I think the challenges are different, but similar. And first, I want to echo what um, was mentioned earlier about, you know, having to do this all in the COVID pandemic time, because, you know, last year, really, everybody was like, okay, can we meet in person? No, you can't. You got to wear a mask. You got to social distance, right? And so then you're like, really far away, you know, trying to meet people and people are kind of scared, but a lot of people need to work, right? Because the whole industry pretty much shut down, right? But animation was kind of still continuing, thriving in the background because things were already kind of set up where people can do their jobs, you know, remotely too as well, right? So that was one of the challenge. And the other thing is um, because, you know, BC minorities in film and TV society, we, we really try to help advocate for underrepresentation for minorities, both in front and behind the camera. So we were working with uh, a team that you know maybe their first language isn't um, English right so there's uh, one more layer of aspect in, in getting into the detail especially with animation right um, and then uh, because it really requires like understanding communicating the stories you know and then somebody drawing the storyboard out and you know really going having that patience um, delay and lag in between just to get the things going so it's not really anything different from working with you know somebody that is speaking you know, as their first language, the same language as you. But I think there's that added um, delay and complexity to that aspect of it. And then um, the the other thing is, um, we also reached out to uh, these indigenous artists and you know throat singers, right? So they were in a very remote location in Canada, and um, of course at the forefront we're, in the get-go it was like oh how do we reach them and where, where to go with the studio and stuff like that you know but then you know you kind of work through it they had their own setup over here they recorded the singing and I was able to share that file and then you you do the sound editing and whatnot from it and then that's when you know magic happens you're everybody just realizes wait I can do this at my spot and then kind of just piece it together. Um, so I think that part was uh, kind of challenging. But having said that, you know, moving forward to this date on June 29th here, I feel like um, 
we can achieve actually quite a bit, you know, even during pandemic times. And I like quite amazing. Um, but first and foremost, I think it's really important that we have patience to allow the things to come into fruition and then not to give sight. And really, like if you're not understanding anything or at the get go to ask questions and it's OK to go back and forth and back and forth until things are on the same page. Right. So thank you. We are almost out of time, uh, but I have one more kind of fun question I would like to ask everybody. So I'll pose it, give you a few seconds, and then we're going to go around in a circle. Uh, and if you could just give me a title and then a one sentence answer to make sure we can fit everybody in. Uh, you know, animation has evolved so greatly over the last hundred years. Uh, and in marks of shorts and features and the work being done today, there are hints of other famous works that have been done throughout history. Uh, I think this is true for pretty much anybody in animation where all the best ideas get stolen and then improved. So I'd like to hear from all of you. Can you name one movie just for us and our audience? Uh, one doesn't have to be animated, but preferably so. Uh, one piece of animation, feature, short, well-known, obscure, doesn't matter. Give us one title that inspire, that inspires you and your work and in one sentence, tell us why. So think one title of any work, any animation that is, inspires your day-to-day -day work and why. Um, and again, if you can just keep your answers to one sentence, uh, just so we get everybody in on time. We're just gonna go around in the order I have on my screen, uh, Emmanuel. Oh, well, <laughs> I can speak for music. I love Disney classics. So I think of the Sleeping Beauty because it's a perfect example of how the classical music of Tchaikovsky becomes something totally different and totally iconic. So it's a model from me, for me. Love it. Uh, next is Gemma. Um, I would have to say a mix of two things from my childhood that inspire a lot of how I create things today. And I think that's a mix of The Little Mermaid and The Simpsons. So <laughs> it's a mix of music and humor that I really, that I think express how I create works today. Only here at OFA will you hear of a musical hybrid between The Little Mermaid and The Simpsons. Uh, next is Ito. I have no idea, no idea, really. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this. I would say maybe Fantasia. I don't know if in, in English was written Fantasia as, as well. No, that's, that's the English. Uh, because it was beautiful and reminds me of my childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you. Tough question. Fantastic Mr. Fox for a craftsman and a color design and just storyline. I love that answer. I'm a big fan uh, of, of the whole studio, but uh, especially Fantastic Mr. Fox. I think it's an underseen gem. Uh, Ekaterina. I would say in terms of like style, um, it's hard to choose like just one, but uh, a lot of shows from Cartoon Network that I watch like uh, Dexter's Lab or Curse the Carly Dog and like more current things from like, uh, Disney Cartoon Network, like Gravity Falls, Steven Universe, and especially anything that mixes like music with um, musical sort of things like Steven Universe is something that I find very inspiring. I think Steven Universe especially does a great job of incorporating music into the storytelling and into plot as well. So I think that's a great example. Uh, Faga. Yeah tough question as well i think i have a bunch of but uh, maybe uh i don't know in english i'm not pretty sure but it's uh wes anderson ales of dogs ale, ale of dogs. isle of dogs yes isle of dogs yeah this one i think it's a beautiful one because like you lisa like color design like color script you know and how the, he create every character like have like a a personality you know so he works pretty well with with not just the shots but also with acting like the way that the characters act for me it's it's beautiful you know so it's an inspiration for me thank you uh meg um, along the same vein as Emmanuel, I would say like classic disney but for me it's 101 dalmatians it just captures this like 
warm, rich, like you can tell it's made by hand and it just has this like amazing sensibility. Like you can feel the world that it takes place in and the story's great too. So definitely that one. I love 101 Dalmatians. Love it. Uh, next is Trey. Hi, so I think I can't speak on behalf of the whole entire team, but there was definitely great influence by Ghibli Studio. So things like, you know, a house moving, castle, spirited away, and all those things where it uses um, kind of the innocence of, you know, childhood, right, to touch on the real social issues. Now, taking back to modern day and the context of this, um, you know, really just looking at the social uh, global issues that are, have been happening kind of thing. So um, for, for me, I feel like there's something magical and innocent in, in animations and despite being that it can touch on really heavy topics adult topics you know so thank you and i think studio ghibli is a great way to do that I'm, I'm glad somebody brought that up because i think we'd be remiss to talk in an animation panel if we didn't mention <laughs> the studio lastly uh but certainly not least james Bourne. i'd have to say um disney's pinocchio uh it's practically perfect in every way nothing has was made as good before and i personally don't think that anything has been as good ever since it's just pure magic i i think that's a popular sentiment to hold as well and i agree um just before we go wendy i'm curious do you have an answer about my favorite animated film yeah what would you say i would have said fantasia mm -hmm. And because I watched Fantasia over and over and over again, just watching how the animation moves with the classical music. And it's just fascinating. I can still, I still have a VHS copy of it. And I throw it in every so often and just listen to it and watch it. Well, all of you have made great choices, all masterpieces in their own right. And I think one of the things that's clear, whatever the format, animation has an ability to really resonate and connect with all ages. Uh, even all of us as adults and adult audiences, even if it's not adult material specifically, this is a medium that really transcends uh, all other forms of art into a great collaborative force. All of you work so hard on your animated short films and we are really honored to have featured them in the Oakville Film Festival this year. So not just, uh, for making your films, but making the time to come here tonight and talk about them. Uh, for our full audience, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests, please thank, join me in thanking all of our panelists this evening uh, for making the time to be here tonight. Emmanuel, Gemma, Ido, you, Baga, Meg, Trey, Ekaterina, and James. Uh, all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your work with us at the festival this year. We were really delighted to have you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Yes. Now, before we go tonight, don't forget, all the shorts that you have seen are eligible for the most important prize that we uh, give away here at OFA, and that is the Audience Choice Award. At the bottom of your screen, when you select any animated short title on the right-hand side, at the bottom, you will see a rating scale of one to five stars, and every film you watch, you are eligible to cast a ballot for that film. We collect those numbers, uh, and those are aggregated to award the audience choice prize at the end of the festival. Our awards night is next Wednesday, July 7th. And we would love to have your votes. If there's any particular film tonight you want to make sure wins, please give a vote for it here at the bottom. Now, this is the closing night of OFA 2021, but it's not the end. We have, after 18 events, there is one more ticket coming up. Starting in just half an hour is our final event of OFA this year, and that is American Desert. That film will be screening at 8 p.m., and there's a live Q&A with the director and writer Adrian Bartol and the cast and star Will Brandt will be joining us. That is our last event for this year. However, all tickets that have premiered are on sale from seven days after their premiere date. That means all the films you've seen tonight will be available to you for another week. And all the tickets that we've premiered since last Wednesday are still available for you to rent if you would like to catch up. So on behalf of all of our wonderful panelists, our executive director, Wendy Donnan, and the incredibly talented Tori Nixon, who has been working on the back end to make these Q&As happen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Tyler Collins. I have been your host. Thank you for joining us for this event of OFA 2021. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in person for OFA next year. 
Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.